All right, we are live, uh, colleagues, if you want to start. Ibrahim, you have uh, you have a comment from Amani. Yeah, I saw that. I okay. I'm working on it. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, we should start uh, while waiting for the others to join. Uh, welcome to our second webinar on SBCC practices for adolescents and youth engagement and empowerment. Uh, my name is Jomana Kalot, I, and I am from the Center for Public Health Practice at the Faculty of Health Sciences at the American University of Beirut. Uh, today, I'm representing the Summit Secretariat and co-organizing this series of webinars, Voices from MENA, with UNICEF's Middle East and North Africa office, represented by Ms. Niha Kapil, uh, SBC and Community Engagement Regional Advisor. Welcome to all. Uh, before I introduce our topics of today's webinar, I would like to give you a brief on the SBC Summit uh, Secretariat events that will lead up to the uh, summit in December 2022. As you know, the summit was postponed from 2020 till December 2022. Uh, leading up to the December 2022, uh, we have at the Secretariat supported the organization of regional events. So what happens that each region, MENA, other regions in Africa, Asia, uh, uh, North America, uh, all the regions uh, have designed uh, programs uh, from the work that has been submitted for the 2020 summit, uh, including regional trends that are now emerging like climate change, COVID-19 uh, and migration. All the topics and dates of regional events 
uh, can be found on the SBCC summit uh, that will be posted uh, shortly on the chat book and on the chat box. Uh, in addition to these regional events, the Secretariat has developed a poster book hosted on the SBCC summit website that has each of the posters that were submitted and accepted. Also, we have an abstract database that hosts all the oral presentations, oral abstracts from 2020. All of these can, uh, can be found on the communication initiative website or link through the SBCC summit website. For the 2022 summit, the themes will remain the same with a little makeover, an update, especially integrating lessons from COVID-19, which we have so many lessons in community engagement and uh, SBC. If you're planning to submit an abstract, the deadline has been extended to April 3rd, 2022. And we also have posted on the summit's website videos on tips for submitting an abstract in four languages, Arabic, English, French, and Spanish. So please don't forget the new date of the summit, December 5 to, to 9, 2022, and looking forward to seeing you in Marrakesh, Morocco in December. Now back to our regional MENA events. Voices from MENA series of webinars that will present current evidence and innovations from social and behavior change communication projects through the MENA. Uh, the focus area of this series of webinars include WASH and climate change, which we have done a webinar back in December, 2021. Adolescents and youth, we're having this webinar now on adolescents and youth, gender-based violence and protection, and health and nutrition. Today, as I mentioned, we are having our second webinar on SBCC practices for adolescents and youth engagement and empowerment. And with, with, without any delays, I would hand over to my colleague, Ms. Aline Germani, who will be moderating this webinar. Uh, before handing it to Aline, I will uh, briefly uh, introduce Aline. Aline is the director of the Center uh, for Public Health Practice at the Faculty of uh, Health Sciences and an instructor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the American University of Beirut since 2006. Prior to joining AUB, Aline held for 10 years several positions in international projects, providing technical assistance to the Lebanese Ministry of Public Health. Aline has a diverse portfolio in providing technical assistance to ministries in Iraq and Lebanon to support youth development. In addition, with several UN agencies, she led several reviews on youth matters in the Arab region, mainly on good practices in adolescence and youth programming, youth participation, youth and violent extremism, adolescent and youth friendly uh, health services. She co-organized the evidence symposium on adolescents and youth in MENA in 2017 and 2018. Aline, over to you and welcome again, all of you for this on this webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jumana. Thank you, uh, Ayunis Afmanaru team and uh, all colleagues on this, uh, uh, on this webinar. I would like, of course, to start by, um, by welcoming our speakers and, um, and uh, uh, yeah, emphasize the importance of, uh, uh, of, such, um, of such a webinar on SBCC interventions in, uh, for youth and for hearing the voices of uh, youth. Um, today we will start by, so we will be hearing about three interventions actually that engage youth in developing and implementing SBCC interventions or SBCC techniques, uh, one to reduce bullying in Jordan, another on influencing gender uh, social expectations in Egypt, and uh, uh, the third one on promoting positive identities in Palestine. Uh, as we move ahead, I will be, of course, introducing the speakers um, uh, before giving them the floor. Uh, we will start first with uh, Dr. Marlene Renders, who will give us a general overview, actually, uh, on highlights on youth and adolescents in the region before we hear our SPCC uh, interventions. 
Um, Dr. Renders is UNICEF's regional advisor for adolescent development and young people's engagement uh, for the Middle East and North, North Africa region. She serves as the co-chair of the UN Arab States Region Issue-Based Coalition on Adolescents and Youth. Uh, she has 20 years of experience covering research, technical leadership and management and international development, peace building and education across Europe, East Africa and the Middle East. Dr. Renders has received her master's in development studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London and her PhD in political and uh, social science from Ghent University. Prior to joining UNICEF, she worked in academic research and higher education. Uh, Dr. Renders, if you'd like to um, share your screen and uh, start. Um, so she will be highlighting mostly challenges also that are faced by young people in the MENA region. Thank you uh, so much for the for the introduction and thank you for your uh, for your kind words. Also, um, it's an honor uh, for me uh, this morning to to join you uh, in this uh, in this webinar on a, on a topic that is um, that is extremely important um, for the region. Um, the cohort of young people um, in MENA region is uh, very large. We're talking about um, 124 um, million adolescents and young people, which is uh, about 20% of um, the population. And please note that um, uh, the population in MENA region um, is expected to more than double in size during the first half of this century. Uh, so this is why we are talking why we are talking about MENA Generation 2030, uh, which is a research that um, a research document that has been um, completed by UNICEF in order to be able to inform um, policy and action uh, for uh, young people at um, a large um, scale. So in the first half of the of this uh, of this century, so let's say between now and 20, 2050. An, an unprecedentedly large uh, proportion of the population will come in their in their in their productive years, which means that um, they're ready to to take up jobs. They're ready to take up jobs. They're ready to take up um, work. Um, this this uh, cohort uh, moving into what in principle should be their um, active lives uh, presents the region with a historic opportunity to. Um, achieve economic growth and more wealth um, for everybody. However, um, in order for that to happen, we need to make an investment in that cohort. If we don't make the investment in our young cohort, the opportunity will unfortunately um, become a challenge. So this is the thing I would like you to, to remember. It's an opportunity. This bulge of young people is an opportunity, but if we don't invest in them, it becomes a challenge. So given the growth of the population in the region, um, without urgent investments in um, healthcare, in uh, protection, in education, any meaningful um, engagement opportunities and thereby enhancing the prospects for productive employment, uh, increased income per capita, and as such then uh, stimulated uh, growth and wealth uh, generation. Um, without this investment, this will not happen. And what we will then get instead of the opportunity is um, 5 million additional children out of school and an 11% increase in young people's unemployment, resulting, of course, in a greater degree of disillusionment in young people. By 2030, we will have in the region, this is what the challenge looks like. This is what it looks like, this demographic challenge. We will have by 2030, um, compared to the beginning of the century where budgets were already strained, um, policies and systems were already strained, we will have 25 million more students to accommodate in school. And we will have 39 million new entrants into 
um, the labor market. This means um, that the region's economies need to create 2.6 million new jobs per year. That's the challenge. What are some of the, uh, the barriers that we are dealing with in um, achieving these, um, uh, this demographic dividend in MENA? We have the issues related to uh, conflict and violence with which you are um, familiar. MENA is home to 6% of the world adolescents, um, but more than one third of the young people uh, live in fragile and conflict-affected countries. We know about Syria, we know about Iraq, we know about uh, Yemen. All of these countries are um, in our region. MENA is home to 58% uh, of the world's refugees and nearly half of the world's internally displaced populations. And we don't talk only about violence at... Um, at the political level or at the community level, we're also talking about violence in the, at the institutional level and at the home level. Um, just to give you an example, um, one in four um, adolescents uh, have reported um, being bullied at school in the last um, two months. We have lots of other challenges that um, um, adolescents are, are struggling with. And one of them, uh, as you can see, is also um, the issue of poverty. Half of our um, 118 million under 18 year olds experience uh, moderate poverty and one in four experience extreme uh, and acute poverty. One in five girls in the region is married, uh, married before the age of 18. And the poorest children are five times less likely to complete uh, primary education. As you may imagine, um, the out of school challenge is um, even more pronounced in the refugee uh, population. And this, this, the example that you see here is uh, from Syria. Um, we have 15 million children in the region um, out of school in MENA uh, because of um, the conflict. Um, the out of school issue is uh, especially pronounced um, in the cohort of children of lower um, secondary age, which are the children that um, go either into higher secondary or unfortunately um, risk to, to drop out and uh, start work too early. We also have a lot of a high number of children in the region that um, work and are in school at the same time, which is a bit better, but still comes with um, with serious protection risks. Not only is access to school an issue, we also are um, struggling seriously with um, the quality of education and the relevance of education. Because um, out of the, the children that are in school, only half of them uh, meet the lowest benchmark in terms of the educational achievement that um, they need to have in order to successfully complete their education and transition to work. MENA has the world's highest youth employment rates um, in the overall population, but it is even more pronounced for um, female youth. Um, female youth employment is uh, 49% in North Africa and 41% in the rest of um, the region. And of course, again, more pronounced um, for refugees. We have... Um, issues with poor quality education, as I mentioned, but also an issue with the mismatch between skills and labor market requirements. What kids learn in school and what kids learn in, um, in TVET and, and in other training opportunities is not adapted to the needs of the labor market. So it's a three-pronged problem. We don't get the right skills the quality of what we are teaching children is not good enough. And then the transition to the labor market becomes difficult also because there is a lack of available jobs. So we need to work on the whole spectrum of issues in order to um, address the learning to earning transition, which is um, one of the biggest challenges in the region and one of the, um, one of the aspects informing youth disillusionment and um, um, protest and, and migration and um, 
coping strategies that young people um, employ in order to um, deal with it. So we have a high level of disillusionment uh, among young people during, uh, because of unemployment, conflict, crisis, and violence. We have an issue um, which is related to discriminatory roles and social norms in terms of gender, yes, but also in terms of um, social groups, in terms of um, um, refugees. And we have a limited space and scope for voice and accountability for young people. So young people are not engaged enough by far in efforts to address the issues that affect them. They're not involved enough. So the only um, option that they really have um, is become angry and protest or leave, migrate. And both, um, both of them happen. They need to be given the platforms and the opportunities to become part of the solution. And that is not yet the case, unfortunately. So as a result of these constraints, young people uh, feel that um, life in the region has deteriorated. Um, they have um, limited confidence in their governments, in um, their government's ability um, in dealing with um, the is issue of um, unemployment. And um, please note that civic engagement levels uh, in the region among adolescents and young people are the lowest in um, the world, uh, lower than Africa, lower than um, Asia, uh, lower than uh, Latin America. So this is, this is something to note for, um, for all of us here on the call. Then of course, we also had COVID um, which came with its own, ch its own challenges for young people. And I just want to uh, give you a very quick overview. Um, a lot of young people had to deal with interrupted education, uh, were struggling with the dig digital divide, access to devices, access to, to learning online, uh, psychosocial and ment mental health needs, as you know, um, skyrocketed. We had a, an increased issue because of the lockdowns and people being uh, stuck at home and not being able to meet other people reaching out. We had an increased uh, um, um, manifestation of uh, domestic uh, violence and girls at risk for gender-based violence, increased uh, risk at uh, child marriage and teenage pregnancy, and even more shrinking space for uh, civic engagement and um, a more severe learning to work transition because of the economic pressures um, caused by COVID as well. So the challenges that were already there before were compounded by the, uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Now, what are some of the, what are some of the uh, priority actions and opportunities? It depends a little bit on where um, countries are in their, in their uh, demographic um, uh, transition. You have the so-called pre-dividend countries where um, the transition has not, uh, has not really yet started, where the population has started to grow, but hasn't reached um, the point where um, the, the transition starts. Uh, in those countries, um, like um, Bahrain, Palestine, Iraq, uh, we need to really invest in early childhood development, uh, in relevant and quality education, uh, facilitating uh, the school to work transition and strong engagement of adolescents and young people. In the countries um, like, for example, Egypt, um, and I'm about to finish, um, Aline, in countries like, uh, like Egypt, uh, which are early dividend uh, countries, we need to focus on education, skills development, vocational training, apprenticeship, entrepreneurship, job placements, transformative social protection measures, and strong engagement of adolescents and youth. This comes back all the time. Countries where uh, we have a more shrinking population, like uh, Lebanon, uh, we still have young people. And we need to focus on skills development, vocational training, apprenticeship. So more focusing on the cohort of young people themselves in order to help them um, deal with their situation. And there again, strong adolescent engagement of adolescents and youth is um, key. And that's where I would like to um, where I would like to stop. Empowerment of adolescents and young people is critical. Uh, participation is to adolescents and young people what play and stimulation is to the ECD 
cohort. Uh, without that, we don't get a, a successful transition to adulthood, uh, where young people transition into productive and engaged adults in their communities. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Over to you, Aline. Thank you, Marlene. And uh, well, I will apologize from all speakers that I'm going to be a little bit strict on time <laughs> because of uh, because of the time constraint. Um, I'll uh, after Marlene's presentation, we will um, we will take some questions uh, from the floor. Um, we'll take like five minutes. Have, have a five minutes Q and A. Uh, you can please. I encourage you to write up in the chat if you would like to speak. Uh, you will have to raise your hand uh, for us to unmute you. Um, so if, if you have any questions, please write them on the chat or raise your hand. Uh, I think the overview is very important. It also, um, it makes us reflect on the need, uh, on how we can use actually SBSS, uh, or sorry, SBCC techniques and, and theories actually to change, uh, to change this narrative and specifically among uh, policymakers and, uh, and community and community members and uh, in order to actually secure their buy-in in improving these conditions or the conditions of young people uh, in the region. And also uh, like Marlene said, how we can use these techniques to increase involvement of young people in their uh, in their communities and in uh, deciding how to improve their situation or on the solutions. Uh, Jumana, I see your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Marlene, for this uh, very interesting uh, overview. Uh, one thing that caught my attention is the investment in early childhood education. Uh, can you elaborate more on how this investment uh, is, uh, can be used in uh, promoting uh, adolescent and youth uh, programs or, yeah. Shall I take a couple of questions or you want me to um, respond one by one? Uh, let's, uh, why don't you respond Marlene while waiting for questions because I haven't seen uh, any yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jumana, uh, for the question. Um, so uh, both ECD and adolescent uh, points in life of a, of a human being, of a developing human being, if you like, are, are uh, as you know, what we call uh, these uh, windows of opportunity. They're windows of opportunity uh, in which um, accelerated learning happens and uh, from a de developmental uh, point of view are, are very important. Um, whatever... Um, because there are two points of acceleration, um, work uh, with adolescents can, uh, to some extent, make up if we have um, missed opportunities at the ECD stage. At the adolescent stage, there are things we can do in order to catch up um, what we missed um, when we were um, en engaging and helping and supporting and nurturing the children they were, when they were much younger. Um, but it's much better to start uh, at the ECD stage, also to put in place a very good foundation for adolescent development, because many of the skills that we are looking at, and we are looking with, uh, um, um, with UNICEF, but also uh, many other partners like the World Bank and UNESCO, we're looking at um, a, set of, uh, of, a set of skills, what we call life skills, or we call them 21st century skills, um, which are related to uh, skills for learning, employability, empowerment, and citizenship. And these skills are, um, the foundation of them is being laid at a very early age. We should start um, at the level of children when they are in, when they are ECD, um, in, in, in their early stages of li life, to um, uh, put, uh, put these um, uh, put these skills at their level in place. So even uh, participation and empowerment of children should start at a fairly early age. Because if you don't do that, when kids are when kids are two to four to six to eight to nine, um, then you have to do a lot of work with the adolescents when you want to 
um, give them the opportunity to participate. You have to work on their self-confidence first. You have to work on their um, capacity. You have to, and if you have been working with children from early age, all these things are already put in place. The skills you teach a person at the level of, of the ECD, early childhood development, prepare children to go into primary school. They'll be better prepared. They'll have better results in primary school. Uh, if they have better results in primary school, they're much better positioned to make the transition to secondary school and beyond. So this is ECD is where we really put the basis in place for all the other stages in life. If we miss it, okay, we can compensate some of it at the adolescent stage. It's much better to start way before. So if your big cohort are the small children, foc really focus on them because it's an investment that will pay off when we try to teach our adolescents later. Thank you, Marlene. So this again uh, uh, brings us to the point where we have to include and maybe address parents, uh, uh, kindergartens, school systems at the primary level uh, to change a little bit uh, the way we approach early childhood development and to enhance actually early childhood development, Marlene. Yeah, and if I may, if I may say so, um, we are not working with the small children themselves. Through our efforts on parenting, uh, the small children and the mm -hmm. adolescents, we also um, give the parents type of the life skills that they need in order to be able to engage with their um, small children, but also with their adolescents in a productive and supportive way. So yeah. it's the whole like uh, socio-ecological um, context that we need to engage with for the small ones, but also for the adolescents, actually. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marlene. I don't see any hands up or uh, questions in the chat. Uh, thus, I think um, we can move on. Just, uh, I, I have an issue here. Just a second. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm going to move on. Thank you very much, Marlene. Of course, Marlene is, uh, I think, is staying with us. Uh, so if any questions come up, you can always write them in the chat, and we can bring them uh, back at the end of uh, at the end of the session. Um, we will. I will start by welcoming. Uh, so we'll go uh, by each uh, presentation alone. Uh, introducing the speakers before, uh, uh, before they speak uh, directly. Um, we'll have uh, the three uh, presenters go uh, um, one by one, and then we'll open it up for uh, uh, question, questions and answers at the end. Uh, please, again, if questions come up while speakers are uh, presenting, just write them in the chat and we'll go over them. Uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the presentations, um, we will start with our uh, first uh, uh, first presenters, and the first uh, presentation is on reducing bullying in Jordan through an edutainment uh, drama series. With us are uh, Sarah Jean Cunningham and Iman uh, Zabalawi, who will be presenting together. Uh, Sarah Jean has founded the Magenta with a mission to disrupt the space of social and behavioral change, combining scientific rigor and technological innovation. She has over 15 years of behavioral research and communications experience, working across the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. She has advised a wide range of governments, UN agencies, and international organizations on improving their communication interventions to support broader policy objectives in many areas, especially child protection and youth empowerment. Uh, Sarah holds a master's in engineering from the University of Cambridge, Cambridge with a scholarship to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Iman, Iman uh, uh, Zablawi is uh, uh, a passionate marketing and communications uh, professional with over nine years of experience in the field. Uh, she leads and oversees the implementation of social behavioral change campaigns for Magenta across the Middle East, ensuring their success and effectiveness. She worked on many youth and adolescent engagement and empowerment projects in the past, 
including TV productions and uh, campaign implementations. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree from AUB uh, and a digital marketing uh, diploma. Uh, Sara and Iman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aline, and it's really a pleasure to be here speaking to you uh, this afternoon. It's actually morning for me. I'm calling you from Mexico City right now. Um, so th thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Iman, who was actually the producer on, on this project and who's going to talk a bit more about kind of the details of um, the production process. Um, but I'm the managing director at Magenta and what we really specialize in is um, understanding what drives human behavior um, and using behavioral science to really help us understand why people do what they do, um, and then using these behavioral insights to develop out social and behavioral change uh, interventions. And we do have a focus on social impact. And as you uh, pointed out, we work in a wide range of sectors um, from education to health um, and work on preventing violence against children, which will be the focus of uh, today's uh, presentation. Um, we work really across the Middle East and we are based uh, in Jordan uh, as, as an organization, um, but work across the wider Middle East and North Africa uh, region. And we're very excited to be part of this um, series of SBCC voices from uh, the MENA region. Um, who's controlling the slides actually? Yep, great. I'll just say next slide. Um, so in 2019, uh, we, uh, sorry, just the previous slide. Um, in, in 2019, we partnered with UNICEF and the Ministry of Education uh, to really address um, this issue around prevalence of, of bullying. And as Marlene pointed out in, in the region, this is really an, an overall issue. Um, I think she cited a statistic uh, that one in four children have reported experiencing bullying in the last uh, two months. In Jordan, um, what the, it's really no exception with 44% of uh, middle school adolescents in Jordan actually reporting um, experiencing some sort of bullying uh, in schools. And so um, we were really tasked with um, taking an SBC approach to understanding uh, the behaviors through a psychological lens, through a sociological lens, um, and really trying to understand, well, what are the determinants of this behavior that we're observing? And so the first thing that we embarked on was actually research um, to be able to extract um, insights um, that allowed us to be able to develop out um, a specific SBC intervention. And in this case, the intervention was actually a 13 part uh, television drama series, which was really designed to take the audience along a behavioral change journey um, accompanied by um, a teacher program um, where we created teacher facilitation guidelines um, in order to be able to help them um, use the content in schools um, and create a, a safe space to be able to talk about these issues. And so the challenge that we really had was to create content that really resonated and that was really relevant um, with the target audience. And we really wanted to take an evidence-based approach um, in order to be able to understand our audience, understand their mindset, their lives, what their real life lived experiences were, um, what their preferences are in terms of you know, media consumption. All of that understanding was really essential for us to be able to design a product that was going to really resonate um, both emotionally and cognitively uh, with our audience. And today, what we'll do is walk you through our methodological process uh, for, for doing that. Um, I wanted to show you first and foremost um, a bit of the trailer um, of the series. Um, this is what we ended up creating um, as the final product. Um, as I mentioned, it was a 13 part series. Um, and then we'll kind of walk you back in terms of everything that went into developing this content. يعني بتعرف شكلها؟ لا 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 بنات حكوا لي الشب تبع السوق كان قدام المدرسه وسأل عني 
ميرنا صح؟ مين ميرنا؟ اسمع بعيد عني ما عنا زلمة بالبيت لازم ندير بالنا على سمعتنا كتير منيح بكرة بتجيب والدك وبتجيني هون لم غصب عنك رايد انت معصب مش هلا بشكل عام انت معصب انا حكيت لك ما بدي اساعده وبستاهل كل اللي بيصير فيه بس انت اللي اصريت طب شو رح تعمل لما اقول <تصفيق> ولو حكيت للمديره ونصلحكنا هناك اذا صار له شيء بحياتي ما رح اسامحك فاهم ليش بكره لازم اعمل اللي قدامكم طلاب المدرسه؟ واذا ما عملته رح ينتشر الفيديو بكل مكان. So the overall objective of the series was to look at reducing bullying in schools, specifically amongst 13 to 16 year olds. Um, and we focused on lower socioeconomic um, status um, and public schools specifically. There are a lot of private schools um, in the Jordan context, but our focus was really on the public sector and this um, adolescent age group of 13 uh, to 16. Um, so first of all, we wanted to understand our target audience um, and then also understand what are the kind of layers of influence um, around the target audience so that we could best uh, reflect um, those different layers in the series that we created. Um, and so, you know, looking at the socio-ecological model and um, first and foremost, um, putting the individual at the kind of center of our thinking, um, but then looking at the, those different layers. So looking at the interpersonal uh, level, which included um, things like, you know, family members, um, school teachers, social workers, counselors, um, looking at the organizational level. Um, which um, look, allowed us to look at um, the role of um, the community, um, school administrators, as, as well as um, different youth centers um, that are prevalent in Jordan. And then we also understood that the role of the environmental landscape was very important um, in terms of specifically looking at the role of media. Um, so we wanted to first apply um, uh, behavioral change analytical framework. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this framework, which is the behavioral drivers model, um, which really uh, allows us to unpack and understand a behavior through the lens of psychological, sociological, and uh, environmental uh, factors. Um, and so within um, psychological factors, um, we first wanted to understand, um, for instance, the different types of heuristics that were involved, um, if we can go to the previous slide, please. Um, the different types of heuristics that are involved uh, in terms of being drivers of certain behaviors, levels of sensitization and awareness um, of bullying and um, how bullying is really defined in the Jordanian context and the understanding of violence. Um, and things like self-confidence, you know, one of the things that we hypothesized um, as an important predeterminant was this idea of, of self-confidence at the individual level. Um, in terms of sociological and, psych and uh, environmental factors, um, we wanted to explore um, social norms and the role that social acceptance of violence really plays um, in um, the, the behaviors that we were witnessing um, in schools. This also include things like um, religious and cultural norms um, and whether that was playing a positive or a negative um, effect. We looked at, as I mentioned, the role of the media and the communications landscape and this analytical framework and the findings um, that we then um, explored uh, from, from the result of the research really underpinned uh, the, the development of the series uh, that we ended up creating. 
So this is the sort of overall methodological process that we used. Um, we use that analytical framework um, to underpin our formative research. And then we then moved into the creative development process. Um, we had an extensive testing period, which Iman is gonna talk um, more about. Um, and then finally, the full kind of content uh, development in terms of the series itself. Um, what was really important as well was the supplementary uh, materials and, and part of the program um, that was really looking at creating um, guidelines for teachers within schools to be able to use this content effectively. And then the final phase, um, which we didn't, we, we didn't actually um, end up implementing was around kind of marketing uh, and, and dissemination. So one of the things I wanted to point out in the next slide, please, um, is the edutainment model uh, that we ended up using. And what was really important was to strike this balance between using the scientific rigorous approach and these key kind of behavioral insights that we, uh, that we discovered, but balancing at that with this engagement and this creative approach, which as we know is equally, if not more important in terms of being able to capture the audience, attract them and hook them and make, making sure that the, the content that we're developing, the, the characters that we're developing, the storylines that we're developing are really relevant and resonant um, with, our, with our audience. Um, and, and ensuring that our both our researchers and our creative teams were kind of working hand in hand um, and I think, you know, in, in the space of SVC, and I hope this is something we get to discuss more, this is, this is a constant challenge is how do we balance um, these sort of policy, these hard policy objectives with things that are actually going to be appealing to youth audiences when you have to work with bureaucracies, when you're working with governments, how do you make sure that you're really able to kind of innovate and you're able to really tap into, you know, what's core, cool, what's happening right now um, amongst youth um, in, in the Middle East. So I wanted to pull out first um, a few of the key research findings that we that really underpinned the development of uh, the series. Um, so I'll start with the psychological findings. So this goes back to, um, as I mentioned, the uh, behavioral drivers model, um, which is a UNICEF model that um, we use to really um, shape the, the research. And so firstly, were the psych uh, psychological findings. Um, so what the result results really showed um, was that um, whilst both children and adults were familiar with bullying, they were not really able to clearly define what bullying me meant or distinguish it from other forms of physical and verbal abuse. So that was a key finding and something that we felt that we could address um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the series itself. Um, the other finding was around confidence, which was something that we hypothesized at the beginning, um, and a lack of confidence um, was really described as being a key predeterminant for those who would either become a bully or a victim. Um, and bullying as a way um, was really seen as a way of expressing a strong and confident personality in the Jordan uh, context. The other key determinant was at home stresses, um, which was something again that we did hypothesize and we did see also from uh, the literature um, and stresses um, coming specifically from broken home lives um, was noted by many teachers and children as being a very common reason um, that somebody might become a bully. And then lastly, power dynamics. And overwhelmingly, those um, interviewed agreed that in Jordan, bullying happens when an individual appears weak and that bullies um, prey on weakness in an effort to demonstrate their own strength. And then moving on to uh, sociological findings, and um, there were two main findings here. Uh, so one was around normative expectations, uh, where we saw that in general, children felt that they were encouraged actually um, by supporting figures in their lives to solve their own problems and defend themselves and their honor. Honor came through as a very strong um, determinant of bullying. Um, and that was really a primary reason as well for why bullying was not reported and is not reported in schools. 
Um, and then in terms of community uh, dynamics, uh, we saw that normative expectations coupled with these community dynamics where adults actually generally turned a blind eye to bullying and really discouraged children from reporting. Um, and this is something we actually saw amongst teachers themselves, um, which was something that um, we were very aware of when we were de developing um, the teacher training aspect um, of the programme. And then lastly, with the environmental drivers, and so here the key finding was really around harmful portrayals and glorification of violence in the media, and how that played a very strong role um, in influencing how children perceive bullying. Um, so that's a summary of the key findings from the formative research, and um, one of the things I wanted to highlight here is that as SBC practitioners, um, we understood that some of those findings we could address through an SBC approach, and, and some of them we needed to really acknowledge and empathize with um, in the development of the series. So knowing that we can't necessarily change it through an SBC approach, but knowing it was something that we really wanted to reflect in terms of the reality of the lives of, of children um, in Jordan. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to a man now who will walk you through um, the rest of the, the process. Thank you, Sarah. Iman, you still have four minutes. <laughs> okay. um, all right, so uh, in order to continue with, the, after finding all those uh, research insights, we uh, proceeded with the creative development of the series. So in order to start with the creative development, there was, a, we followed a process that comprised of several steps. Uh, so we wanted to follow those steps in order to ensure that our behavior change framework that we addressed at the beginning was adhered to and that our final content is both educational and entertaining in order to achieve our edutainment model. So um, uh, we started with a creative development workshop where we had a workshop between the creative team of Magenta. Uh, no, if we can go back to the first slide, please. Uh, between the creative team of Magenta and between UNICEF. And from this workshop, we came up with two main, um, we wanted to discuss two main uh, things, which are the key elements of this series and the creative concepts of this series. So we had a discussion, we had some brainstorming, we followed some key insights in order to come up with one creative route forward. This creative route route resulted in the creative concept of the series, as well as the basic premise and the care characters that we will see in the series. Therefore, in order to achieve that, we followed our behavior analysis matrix that you can see on the slide. So in order to follow the behavior analysis matrix, we wanted to make sure that all our key um, characters, our key messages, our episodes and objectives are all tied up to the behaviors that we came up with in the research um, phase. So for example, for episode one, we made sure that uh, the summary um, has all our key messages and that our objectives are, are being met through those episodes. So this is an example of how we use our behavior analysis matrix. And this matrix was done for, um, uh, for all of the episodes that we worked on. And therefore, it was uh, the springboard for all of the scripting to follow. After that, we had a series development workshop where we had a creative route to follow. And from the creative route, we came up with a pilot episode. We, we, we shot this pilot episode and we decided to test it with the target audience to make sure that all the messages resonate with our target audience and that the content is, is understandable uh, for our target audience. Therefore, we followed this creative concept week where we made sure that uh, um, our, uh, our series is understandable. And from our target audience, we noticed that this was intermediate. People were able to understand it, but there were some scenes for some characters that were not very fully understood. Therefore, we made sure that when we develop the entire series afterwards, we, we uh, develop those characters for those specific scenes so that the series is more understandable for our target audience. We also made sure, we also checked the relevance where we noticed that the relevance is high. Our target audience felt that the bullying they're seeing in the pilot episode is relevant to them. They see such scenes in their schools on a daily basis and in their homes as well. The accuracy in the series was intermediate, so they noticed that it's accurate, all the scenes are accurate, but some of them are very um, uh, 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 harsh on them, so we made sure that in our um, discussion guidelines later on, we, we guide our facilitators on how to um, guide those discussions for those specific episodes. And the engagement for the pilot episode was high, so we made sure that people are engaged and are liking the, uh, the episode. Afterwards, um, 
we proceeded with working on the entire 13 episodes um, based on the results we saw in the testing of the pilot episode, and we came up with the support materials. The support materials comprised of a master guidelines, episodic guidelines, and the teacher's workshop handout. Those mainly, the master guidelines had uh, guidelines for, um, for the facilitators on how to facilitate a productive discussion with the target audience when they present um, uh, the episodes. We also gave them uh, a more um, detailed guidelines, which is episodic guidelines on how to um, foster a, a productive discussion between the facilitators and um, and the target audience on specific episodes. And we also had the handover for teachers, which is a teacher workshop handout. Um, I think you sent me that the time's up. But anyway, just a final remark that um, this was our project. The project is still in approval by the Ministry of Education. And as soon as it's approved, we will work on the marketing and dissemination, and it will be disseminated both offline and, off and online. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Iman. I'm sorry for pressuring the speakers on time, but uh, that's the moderator's <laughs> difficult role. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, presentation. We'll comment and open it up for questions uh, at the end, as I said. Uh, we'll move on now to our next uh, presenter, uh, hmm. Gaia. I will introduce Gaia now. She will be uh, presenting an intervention on girls' voices driving the change in Egypt. Uh, Ms. Gaia Strigelli is a program manager with extensive experience in international humanitarian development and private sector environments. She has over 12 years of experience as advisor in social and behavioral change, advocacy and partnership management for UNICEF, UNFPA, and Internews Afghanistan, Care Kenya and Danish Refugee Council in Somalia. Uh, previously a prize winning journalist, edutainment producer and partnership manager in the media industry in Europe, Africa, South America and Asia. Welcome Gaia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much Alina and thank you all uh, for the opportunity. It's, um... It's great to be here with you. Uh, so as I said, I'll uh, briefly present you what uh, we are doing here in Egypt, uh, uh, focusing on girls' empowerment. Um, why we do it, uh, perhaps there's no need to explain, but I mean, there are almost 20 millions of girls be below the year of 20. And uh, as we know, uh, most of them, uh, if not the majority of them, uh, um, do not have access to fully develop themselves or, or to reach their, uh, their own potential. So that's the, the, the reason why we, what we are doing, we are investing so much uh, on this. Um, I would like to start by uh, sharing the, this uh, uh, short uh, or a, a little part of a documentary that we have done uh, about these girls that are uh, engaged with the National uh, Girls Empowerment Initiative called DAWI, and then uh, we'll move from there. Thank you, and uh, uh, please go ahead with the, with the film. في فكرة حلوة ممكن نعمل دايرة حكي اللي هي دلوقتي أنا مثلاً هسأل هسألك سؤال فأنا اللي هتكلم فاللي هيتكلم هيربط على إيدي وأنا بعدين أول ما أسألك السؤال أمي ديك الحب أنا بحس لما بشوف أي بنت ناجحة فخورة بيها جدا ببقى عايزة أعمل زيها بالفعل مبسوطة جدا للبنت دي إن هي عملت وصلت لحاجة زي كده وإن هي أكيد واجهت صعوبات كتير عشان توصل لحاجة لحلمها أنا بعمل حاجات كتير ولقيت ناس كتير ما بتبقاش عارفة حاجة موجودة في المجتمع غلط زي البنت ملهاش التعليم لا البنت ما تشتغلش تاني الاناث انا عايزه اغيرها ربنا اللي خلقنا خلقنا احرار فانت ما ينفعش انت انسان زي تقيد حريتي دي فانت من انا من حقي طالما ما بعملش حاجه غلط طالما ما بأذيش حد انا ليها حق ان انا اخد طريقي وزي ما انا عاوزه مش حد اللي خطط لي انا اللي خطط مستقبلي وانا اللي خطط طريقي أكتر حاجات يعني عملتها عن زوج الأطفال وكده كنت أول حاجة بتكلم مع بنات في المدرسة عن كده 13 سنة مخطوبة 
ده انا لسه باكل مصاصه يا جماعه دي 13 سنه مخطوبه اللي مخطوبه دي طب هم مستعجلين ليه مثلا يعني 13 سنه دي عقلها لسه لان هو كل واحد ليه مرحله يعني انا انا فكري من سنتين غير فكري من دلوقتي غير بعد كده فاللي هو ما عندهاش النمو الكامل في دماغها ان هي تستوعب المسؤوليه دي وبالتالي يعني فعلا بيحصل مشاكل كتيره قوي ويعني طلاق كتير يعني طفله اتجوزت وطفله اتطلقت فاللي هو ليه حرام ان احنا نموتها بدري بابا كان دايما يعني يقول الجمله دي كتير قوي ان هو كان بيقول انا حاسس ان لا هي اللي هتغير حياتنا انا ان شاء الله هكون قد المسؤوليه واكيد مش هغزيله ابدا وهخليه مبسوط انا حامل نفسي اني اكون حاجه كبيره في مجال السينما او في صناعه الافلام يعني عشان اقدر اوصل رسالتي نفسي تدعموا بناتكم وولادكم وتقربوا منهم قوي تفهموا بعض وتعرفوا هم عايزين ايه وتقفوا جنبهم هتتبسطوا جدا لما تلاقوا ان في ثقه وتواصل بينكم ما بينتهيش ولا هينتهي عايزه اقف كده اقول انا اللي مامي سماء انا هو مامي سماء دي اللي بتتكلم عنها في سن سماء الصغير ده فحاجه جميله جدا 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 وابهرتني فعلا يعني ما كنتش متخيله اقرب الناس كان يقول لك مثلا يقولوا لي لا انت جايبه بنوته جبتي انت لا انت لسه ما خلفتيش فالكلمه دي كانت صعبه جدا عليا فقررت ان انا لازم اثبت ان البنات دول زي الولاد بالظبط اه شوفوا البيت عندكم اوكي Thank you so much. So the, the, the film is called It Takes a Village uh, to support all the, those girls. And uh, um, that's the ultimate scope of uh, the National Girls Empowerment Initiative. Uh, here you see uh, Hala actually um, interacting with the uh, First Lady um, and uh, the head of the National Council for Childhood and Motherhood. This happened last week. Uh, Hala was actually uh, requesting and uh, obtain um, uh, the first lady's auspices for the initiative. Um, and that is a great step to actually scale up all uh, this type of work. So it's a great achievement done uh, through the voices of these girls. Uh, and as I said, the scope of the initiative is to facilitate the expression and, 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 and allowing girls to um, uh, articulate and, and, and have the opportunity to express uh, their opinion and voices, but also to connect them with the uh, policy and decision makers so that the, the narrative, the overall narrative uh, around gender equality in Egypt is changing based on what, how girls themselves and boys clearly, not only young girls, but they uh, um, are, are, are shaping basically. And so that is the core of uh, the initiative. Uh, it all starts with a very simple um, uh, opportunity or platform, which is a chat, as you can see among girls and, and uh, sometimes also boys. Uh, due to sensitivities, it's easily to have it uh, starting only with girls, but that is how simple is the triggering element of uh, the DAWI initiative. But beyond this, there is, and if we can go uh, uh, to the next slide, there is an entire ecosystem um, which uh, uh, the initiative is trying to support uh, and to uh, strengthen uh, day by day. So yes, we do have a, a substantial community engagement package that is uh, focusing, as I said, on, on, on peer to peer, but also intergenerational dialogue and uh, in, and it also helps to create opportunity for uh, those girls and, and those parents and boys supporting those girls 
um, to be visible at community level. We do have a component of capacity building that it is, um, you know, uh, focusing mainly on digital literacy because we see that access to um, um, uh, the, the digital uh, um, domain it, it for certain girls facing particular um, difficulties at households can help to uh, strengthen themselves and also to um, uh, move on towards the, the, the empowerment journey. Uh, there is an infrastructure on uh, um, uh, using uh, UNICEF uh, developed system that is called Rapid Pro to actually use mobile phone to interact um, with uh, people in most uh, vulnerable communities. And the system is set to, uh, yes, communicate uh, with people, but also to um, have an infrastructure to monitor how behaviors are changing among those engaged in this type of intervention. Uh, of course, there is, as uh, Sarah uh, uh, explained, there is a great role to play for media, uh, and um, Egypt is an app of media production, so it's, uh, there is a substantial work or, or in terms of content production, entertainment, but also um, working with the uh, media authorities in the country so that they are uh, setting standards uh, for um, media conduct vis-a-vis -vis children's rights and also um, how to avoid stereotypes and uh, enhance facilitating um, modeling gender equality at scale. As you, uh, as I said, I mean, there is a, uh, there is a work that is ongoing at uh, policy level. Um, and here I want to stress the, the role of coordination and that uh, the initiative is playing among different uh, stakeholders and different uh, uh, ministries, uh, it's a substantial one, um, uh, but also the, the, the role it's playing to, um, to gain uh, and to support the political momentum that it is very much needed to accelerate this type of work. In terms of evidence generation, we are uh, supporting the, the development of, of a, a national framework and eventually uh, 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 a national index to monitor girls' empowerment in Egypt. And this is an ongoing conversation that we hope uh, this uh, high political uh, uh, commitment will help us to, um, to push. The, the index will be most probably uh, focusing on uh, access to uh, services, skills, and the opportunity to participate for girls uh, in Egypt, just to uh, summarize it. Uh, yeah, next uh, slide, please. Um, these are the simple assets produced by the initiative to activate the, uh, the work, uh, but the overall design of this is really, um, the, the idea is, is how to facilitate your organic adoption and engagement with the initiative. So the tools are extremely simple. Uh, self-explanatory and um, available uh, um, online um, uh, and, and, and we are actually the work that the initiative is doing at this stage is, is uh, enhancing strategies and, and, and engaging um, uh, different uh, uh, platforms to, uh, uh, with, the, with the initiative and I give you just an example Thanks to this uh, first lady uh, attention, we, we now have the Ministry of Education um, uh, planning to engage with, uh, with DAWI at scale in all the schools uh, and community-based community -based schools in Egypt, which is a great step forward. Um, as you can see, the tools are digital. You have, we have a website at uh, DAWI Facebook page, but uh, there is a toolkit for, uh, faci to facilitate these circles. Uh, as I said, it, the idea is really very simple to um, help and create the space for girls to uh, share their experiences and, and, and share opinion on, yes, suggested, suggested topics, but also topics that they want to discuss. There is a policy level uh, document developed by the initiative, that, uh, a digital literacy toolkit, which is focusing on how to use technology to overcome gender barriers. Uh, so it's a quite of a unique uh, perspective. It takes a village. The documentary is, is going to be used as a, uh, um, a way to engage with uh, uh, viewing clubs and community dialogue opportunities, the DAWI app, and then there is the DAWI community engagement toolkit. Uh, as I said, all is available online. Next slide, please. 
quick, uh, uh, yes, this is just to, to visualize how all these interventions are happening at the same time. And they, they are just the starting point to hopefully generate uh, uh, um, or support or enhance visibility to this work on girls' empowerment uh, that uh, is perceived by the government as a, a great accelerator to achieve um, uh, Egypt uh, Vision uh, 2030, which is the, the way to achieve the sustainable development goals uh, designed by, by Egypt. So it's, it's really, and I'm, I'm stressing this point, the, the, the initiative is really playing the role of a, a coordinator, or perhaps we can say an orchestra director, so that all the pieces can um, run uh, or, uh, at, at the same time or, 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 or in synergies, I would say. Uh, next slide, please. This is a quick overview of the uh, achievements so far. Uh, we started designing uh, this uh, initiative in, in 2018 with the focus group with young people, uh, but also um, a validation workshop with the UPenn University uh, to make sure that the direction uh, um, we, we took was, uh, was valid. Um, and it proved to be, uh, I must say. Um, and then the official launch, yes, was was at a quite um, you, know, um, you know high level. It was during the uh, African Union conference uh, on harmful practices, which took place here in Cairo. Then the 2020 testing and of course COVID, so we had to <laughs> slow down a bit. Uh, we uh, shifted into the digital, or we strengthened the di digital uh, dimension in 21. And then in 22, as I said, the scaling up. Now the initiative is not only about to be mainstream in the education system, but is also already embedded within the one of these um, mega initiative of, of the president, which is the family development package, meaning that uh, every uh, development partner or institu uh, national institution dealing with most vulnerable uh, households will need to uh, pay attention to girls empowerment and most probably utilize the developed already developed uh, tools and as I said they are so simple that um, there is little investment in terms of capacity building. Uh, these are the numbers of people trained in terms of digital literacy and get, uh, community members engaged uh, face to face and online and number of uh, service providers trained. Um, quite promising results from the digital literacy uh, training pre and post in terms of uh, uh, self-efficacy, we can say, and then also in terms of uh, uh, understanding and acknowledging uh, uh, a gender dimension of, uh, of social dynamics. The next step, uh, as I said, we are investing on the uh, uh, monitoring framework. Uh, but also on the scale and, and more and more on the media sector and on the partnership with a focus on redu uh, reduction of the digital uh, divide for girls. Very briefly, the lesson learned. Um, yeah, uh, the, the national ownership for sure. And, and as I said uh, already, the, the, this dimension of coordination of efforts, it's uh, extremely important. Uh, um, the design that it needs to be from the very beginning uh, so easy enough or uh, resonate enough to be scalable and not, uh, um, you know, not uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, it's not, uh, it, it might not be perfect. The tools that, that have been developed might not look perfect if you just look at them, but the fact that they are so simple is actually uh, uh, you know, driving the, the, the engagement of, uh, um, of, uh, of partners, organic one, which is extremely important given the, 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 the magnitude and the scope of the, the, the objective uh, that we have. And then perhaps the last point, which I think it's one of the most important one is the way we uh, conceive this initiative is, Again, not much in terms of what are the content, but is more how do we create platforms and, and, and opportunities for um, the meaningful engagement that, that Merlin was referring to, uh, but also safe and also um, 
uh, an engagement that is leading towards some some impact, such as, for example, uh, you know, um, dealing with the, with the decision makers, which is just an example because uh, you know all, all this is also happening at household level and not necessarily at the only at the political one. So the 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 shift from the what <laughs> into the how, if you want. Uh, it, it was a very important one, uh, and, and also last point, and then I'll close, uh, is the platform per se, so that the, the scope is to create a platform. What is in that platform? The what and the conversation is actually shaped by young people the, themselves, so that uh, we expect to resonate and to uh, uh, lead towards a more um, sustainable uh, behavioral change. And so this is uh, perhaps uh, an area that requires further reflection, uh, evidences, or um, you know, uh, but but it, it it's definitely a, a, a very it's a very important one, and it's what is uh, perceived as uh, um, particularly you know um, innovative, especially here in Egypt uh, about the the, the DAO initiatives. Thank you so much, and please uh, share your feedback and also your experiences so that uh, we can improve what we're doing. It's really a, a work in progress. Thank you, and over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gaia. I think your presentation highlights really the importance of uh, uh, partnering with government and, uh, and with ministries and in order to institutionalize and scale up um, uh, scale up interventions. We'll discuss this more uh, in, the, um, in the last part. I would like to uh, note uh, that more, more than two thirds or the majority of um, attendees uh, joined after 1 p.m. Uh, I think um, there is an issue, there was a mix up in time. So we have actually started at 12. Uh, Beirut time, 1 p.m. Jordan time, and uh, we do understand that this time uh, difference has made some, uh, uh, some mix up because um, many have joined after or in the middle of Gaia's presentation. Uh, we apologize for this, and um, I think the I think the, the uh, organizers would be ready to maybe, I don't know, Jumana, uh, Rania, to share the presentations later on with, uh, with the attendees, or uh, I'm not sure how we can, Jumana? Yes, uh, the whole webinar would be posted on the uh, summit, SBCC summit website. I will, I will again uh, post the link to the summit. Okay, please do. So for those who have missed uh, the, uh, the start of this webinar where we had an overview from uh, UNICEF Menaro on the challenges faced by young people in the region. And then we had the presentation from our colleagues in uh, Magenta on uh, reducing bully bullying in Jordan. Uh, so the whole webinar, as Jumana said, will be posted online. Um, again, we apologize for this mix up. Uh, we're going to move forward with um, our third uh, speaker uh, who, who will be speaking on an online edutainment series for social change in the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, Nida Heneiti. Uh, she will be, uh, Nida is, uh, has been a youth program coordinator for Oxfam uh, since to, uh, 2020 and the occupied Palestinian territories. She leads Oxfam's efforts in integrating youth programming and engaging young people in all countries, uh, influence, uh, in all country programs and projects, including Oxfam's communication, campaigning, advocacy, influencing work, whether it is implemented directly by Oxfam or through partners or through informal Palestinian youth groups and movements. Uh, over the past 20 years, she has led multi-sectoral consortium programs in local and international development organizations in uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, Nida, the floor is yours. Uh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm actually replacing Neda. Ah, Katinka. Yes, of course. No problem. So I'm Katinka. Yeah. I'm a colleague of Neda. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a part of the uh, Palestinian office. I'm part of the office based in The Hague, but I, I do work for Oxfam, and I have uh, experience in uh, entertainment. Uh, I know some of the colleagues here, and then uh, and I have been advising on the the series you're. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. So let's start. Um, uh, this series uh, called Salma and uh, Sari is indeed uh, an online uh, series. It was part of a project called Wujud, and that means existence and presence. And this project was led by, by Oxfam and, uh, and uh, four Palestinian organizations. And the idea was um, that we wanted to enhance um, Palestinian resilience living in the, in the city uh, by really responding to the needs of some of the most vulnerable uh, Palestinian communities in, in East uh, Jerusalem. And through the edutainment series, uh, we wanted to strengthen uh, particularly uh, youth identity to promote uh, positive uh, behavior and also support women's rights. And uh, the whole, um, I think it was also said uh, in, the, in the webinar the, uh, by, Mar by Marlene, uh, the, the whole um, outlook for young people in the region and specifically also in, in Palestine is leading to negative behavior. So this series uh, really wanted to promote positive, uh, more positive behavior and also a, a, a support network uh, for young people amongst themselves. So that was the, the whole idea. Uh, before you will look, before you will actually see a little bit of the the series itself, uh, I will explain uh, what it is about. So it's about uh, two young Palestinian friends um, who's actually, the, their family make it a little bit difficult for them to make their own decisions and also follow their dreams. Uh, the series is set in East Jerusalem uh, where uh, the future for Palestinians living uh, in the city is uncertain, huh? they, they live uh, uh, their lives under a co coercive environment enforced by the, uh, the Israeli uh, occupation. And it's really stressful. And the pressure of that really leads to aggression and also a, a confusion in their identity, whether they, are, they feel Palestinian or whether they uh, uh, are adapting to the, the Israeli uh, culture. This identity search and this conflict is in, integrated into a boy meets girl uh, story and uh, as their two lives intertwine, the tension builds. Uh, and the characters find themselves in a situation that they aren't really ready for, and must, they must make some uh, difficult decisions. I'm not gonna explain the whole series here. I think it's, it's, it's still available for you to watch uh, on, on the, on the uh, internet. Uh, so please, uh, can we see the trailer? Hmm. Is it working? <laughs> Ibrahim, we can't see the trailer actually. Just let's um Okay, uh, meanwhile, I would really like to apologize from Katinka. I know that there was a change in the, <laughs> I, just, I just missed that. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll provide a short uh, bio for Katinka, who's, uh, the Katinka Munen is the policy and influencing uh, specialist gender justice and uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health at Oxfam uh, Novib. She has been working uh, for many years with partners and colleagues 
to integrate social uh, and behavior change communication work into Oxfam's work, uh, amongst other gender-based violence and child uh, marriage. She has had an advisory role on the preparation of the Salma and Sari series, really. I do apologize, Katinka, for this No mistake. problem, no problem. Uh, Rania, uh, Ibrahim, what, do we have an issue with the trailer? Shall we move on with the presentation and put the trailer later? Yeah, should I move? Uh, okay. uh, yes, sorry, we had a problem with the video playing in the background. But yeah, let's continue with the uh, presentation, please. Okay, I will do so. Um, so actually, uh, what we wanted to do with this series is we really wanted to co-create it with young people. Uh, so the, the, the series is entirely created together with, with young people. And uh, together with them, we also want to determine what is actually uh, the, the problem or what should we focus at within the series. And uh, so we conducted a focus group uh, discussion with civil society organizations and our par partners and within, uh, with, with young people, 36 uh, young men and women. And simultaneously, we also had an edutainment expert uh, training uh, Oxfam and these partners and this group of young people during a really a short, <laughs> short uh, uh, a crash course on, on edutainment to identify the most alarming behaviors uh, among young people in East Jerusalem. And this resulted in a, in a consensus document, uh, which uh, uh, um, built our, our theory of change. Um, and we, we continued this uh, input um, uh, work of, of, of working, on the, working on the series uh, with, together with young people throughout the whole story and writing uh, process. Next slide, please. So um, uh, we also, uh, in the pre-production phase, started working with uh, an entire crew with uh, young people from the, the city. Uh, so we had selected a crew of 45 Palestinians and um, the, the, the actors themselves were also uh, not famous at all. They were, uh, they were just, you know, recruited or uh, casted from, from the community. And then um, the decision was made for the promotion to not do it on television because we actually found out that young people wanted it to be on the web. So uh, we also had a youth-led media company recruited to build the website and promote the series online. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the actual problems that were identified uh, together with these young people is, yes, we, we, they, they felt the isolation, they felt the pressure from the occupation and uh, the patriarchal society, so their families and their environment making it really hard for them to make their own uh, decisions in life. There's lots of discrimination on the basis of gender. And then the lack of ownership they felt, and they really feel that uh, over their personal choices. So then that again leads to negative behaviors such as drug abuse and also the lack of, 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 of hope for the future. Uh, we can't change the world overnight. So we re like, like I said, we really wanted to focus on what it is that youth could create amongst themselves. How do they, could they create a more positive outlook on life? And we wanted to work on their self-awareness, stronger self-expression and the acceptance of others and also uh, related to that, uh, to, to gender equality. So you will find in the series also uh, uh, st the story of marriage, eh? Child, uh, marriage being pressured upon, upon, in this case, Salma. And she tries to uh, escape that, uh, that, that marriage. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So then also, since we are, uh, we are an NGO, <laughs> And we didn't want to be, you know, having that tone and, and a voice. So we had to be really critical also towards our own, uh, you know, build up of the story. You, you have to, you have to be, uh, you shouldn't be NGO. You shouldn't dictate most of all, and you shouldn't victimize. People want to stay away from that. You have to be local, young, fresh, 
And also the, the motivational empowering element is really uh, important. It should spark debate, should, so it should have an, an element of, of, hey, this is, has never been discussed before in our, in our group. Uh, this is something we wanna, uh, so you have to be a bit daring. And they wanted to have some strong women's roles in the series and, and, and be able to normalize uh, the taboos. Um, next slide, please. So this is the whole promotion package that you can see. Um, we, we used all of the um, possible uh, social media out there, the ones that were used most by young people. We also uh, had conversations with influencers whether they wanted to collaborate with us on the series. Uh, there was a whole set of giveaways uh, alongside and we had uh, quite a bit of media coverage, coverage and a third party promotion. Um, and uh, um, yeah, this all led to, in itself, a quite nice, next slide please, quite nice um, uh, engagement online. Uh, we had a total of 29 episodes, which were divided into three chapters. So each week, one, one, one chapter. And this led to, well, 10,000 unique views, uh, well, loads of, uh, loads of uh, video views, especially on Facebook and, uh, and, and also on Instagram. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a bit, bit of the insights. As you can see, um, some of our, or, or most of our um, uh, viewers were, were uh, females. Um, uh, so that is something that we still wanna, well, we wanted to look into also in terms of, hey, who is it that we wanted to reach? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything else on this page. Um, maybe next slide. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, influencers at work. Uh, those, this was, uh, those were the posts actually shared by others so that they um, had a, um, an additional uh, viewer uh, uh, exposure. And uh, also to say that each and every um, uh, episode was accompanied by additional conversations also and, and, and sometimes a poll. So, this is on the next slide. Um, so there were, there were a couple of conversations, we had polls and then people could actually also uh, ask questions um, uh, and really have a, a conversation together on the platform with other young people. That's on the, also on the next slide. Please, next slide, please. So here, um, here you can see um, uh, what we did, for example, asking the audience some questions uh, related to the series, uh, trying to also see, you know, um, gender related topics. Like we had a fight yesterday and I hit her. Is Sari entitled to hit Salma after what happens? So this, we would wanted to also measure this type of, you know, uh, how, how, what, what does, what does, uh, what do young people think? And are your parents involved in your future path and decisions? So we, we wanted to know what youth was experiencing. experiencing. Um, yeah, so a couple of more questions on that. Um, that uh, uh, we also did a poll that education actually is way more important than, than marriage. Um, and that Salma in the end of the series, by the end of the series, she, most of the people felt she had the right to make a decision on her own without discussing it uh, with, with Sari, with her, with her boyfriend. So this is, uh, these are interesting uh, findings from the series. Uh, in Jerusalem, it were the ones, uh, uh, it was most featured, it was most watched across all platforms. Um, the Instagram followers prefer to interact through, the, through stories and direct messaging. Yeah. Facebook was at the time the cheapest and the highest rates of engagement were actually on weekends. Maybe uh, the most <laughs> asked question was, will there be a second season? This was a bit difficult because, you know, this, it, it's a very complicated and also uh, it, very intense and quite expensive uh, process. And uh, yeah, not, not yet. Uh, we wanted to, but uh, not, uh, didn't have the means at the time. There was also an impact evaluation and I can really be really short about this actually. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the main question we wanted to ask ourselves was, 
did it really create a positive change in identity among you, amongst youth in East Jerusalem? And if so, how? And we didn't really find, I have to, that's a bit disappointing. I didn't, we didn't find uh, an, ex, an, actual, uh, an actual change in this, um, in this uh, outlook. And we felt when we, when we um, discussed this, obviously with the, with the team that, yeah, we were only about to engage on a quite difficult topic and there wasn't enough time for young people now that they were really starting to like the actors and to, uh, or the, the, the characters embodied by the actors, we, they didn't really, the actual change didn't happen. So that was disappointing to see. Maybe we can have a look at the, at the next slide. So this is um, we, how we broke down the, 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 the randomized control trial. Uh, all these uh, all these items were were asked um, attitudes on physical and, and verbal GBV attitudes on gender roles attitudes on objectif objectification of the opposite sex all these questions were were were, were asked um, and we do think that it might also have to do the fact that we did, we didn't really see any major significant change was that we already we work with a group of young people, and that's the risk that you run that was already interested in this type of engagement. So you might, you might, you might not see the, the, the actual change happening. So that was something that uh, we realized uh, during, uh, during the whole project. Next slide, please. Well, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and you can still watch it. Uh, thank you, Katinka. There was, yeah. uh, if you can um, share the link, so um, uh, on the chat, it would be great. The link to the trailer, sure, if you are can. able to uh, to put it so that uh, people could be uh, would be able to uh, listen to it and watch it later on. Yes, I will do so. Okay, so I think um, so. I'll open it up for uh, questions now. Uh, as I said, for those who joined late, if you can write your questions on the chat, please, or raise your hand so that uh, I can give you, uh, we can unmute you and give you the chance to, to speak. Uh, I think we already have uh, a question on the chat from uh, Arir. So Arir was asking about the ethical approval procedures for working with adolescents. Uh, as a sample, and this question is addressed actually to um, uh, to uh, Iman and uh, Sarah. Sure, I can answer that. Um, so the research that we did uh, in Jordan did involve working with youth and adolescents. So we took um, partially a kind of ethnographic approach in terms of uh, observing them in both their home environments, but also in their school environments. The research also involved um, interviewing uh, teachers and school administrators. And we did go through, it was a purely qualitative approach and we did go through a UNICEF ethical review board uh, process um, for that. Um, I don't know if there's a, a more specific question, but um, I mean, essentially, because we were doing research with children, we did um, use um, our kind of ethical research guidelines um, that we adopt when we're um, doing research with children to ensure uh, protection and do no harm. Um, in addition, all of our production crew um, were trained on child protection issues and, and there was a referral system in place because we were working with um, child actors um, so there was uh, a strong kind of child protection approach also during the production of the series itself. Uh, thank you Sarah. Uh, there was a comment from Nibal um, and I think it came up uh, or uh, again during the presentation of uh, Sarah and Iman uh, and Gaia, I think, uh, which is, the, uh, so it's more of a reflection. 
Uh, and she says prompting the good young influencers is really important, especially that social media now support the negative models uh, and practices. Uh, so that's a comment from uh, Nibal. Uh, Arij has a follow-up question, actually, uh, I think. Uh, and she's asking about settings, pa parents. So uh, you know, I think you meant Arij consenting parents and consenting maybe schools. This is what you meant, Sara, if you can answer this also. Uh, so, so all of those who were interviewed, yes, had consents, had consented to being part of the research, and so that included uh, children, adolescents, uh, parents, as well as um, teachers and school administrators. Um, but for us, it was important to take that evidence-based approach and make sure that we were engaging uh, young people and adolescents throughout the production of the series as well, so that we could constantly ground truth, um, our approach uh, and the content that we developed in actually what young people would um, want uh, to see and consume. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Sarah, I think. Um, any other questions? Uh, while waiting for other questions, I have, uh, I have a couple or a few to... Um, uh, to our uh, speakers. Um, Gaia, I would like um, maybe if we can, because I, I think you highlighted again the importance of, uh, of involving ministries, governmental entities. Uh, it, it would be interesting to understand how were you, were you able to grow uh, this coalition? How were you able or what are the methods that you used to actually build this consensus among the ministries and national councils? Yeah, well, for sure, the co-designing, they've been part of the process since the very beginning. So that is, a, that, that, that is key in, in, uh, in building the, the, the partnership, but also in, in uh, making sure that what, what you develop is actually comprehensive and it resonates. So that was the key element. There is for sure a bit of uh, personality driven <laughs> type of uh, uh, support. Uh, and so when we managed to have a uh, um, you know, well positioned leader uh, um, on board, of course, the, 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 the initiative uh, moved like uh, it happened over the past few months. And that is uh, for sure an important element. Um, and, and then, as I said before, there is a um, an element of simplicity and design to go at scale. So you are not saying this is, you're not calling the different parts on a specific uh, uh, content or curricula or, or project per se, but you are rather offering certain tools and then calling the different parts and, you know, take what you can and adapt and run with it based on a certain number or, or certain principles and certain um, common objective uh, that that, uh, that you can shape the way you think it's more relevant for your organization for what you have uh, in your uh, specific context uh, for your uh, uh, you know you might have a, a, a region or a village with certain specificity different from the one that you have the next village and this can also happen at the household level so the design as i said uh, focusing on platform and, and supporting the process and, and facilitating the visibility of it. So that design helped a lot to build the, uh, the, 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 the coalition and, and now also the political support. I hope I answered your question, but uh, yeah, happy to follow up. Over. Yes, thank you, because I think it's important to, to take these as lessons for, uh, for, uh, for future programming. Um, I have also another question for uh, Katinka. Um, uh, Katinka, so I think uh, it's, it's very interesting that you have developed this evaluation, the impact evaluation uh, process from the beginning. I do understand that uh, it has not cha uh, shown uh, much change. Uh, I think there is not much evidence today of um, social media or uh, digital platforms uh, being actually effective 
And um, so there is no evidence that supports or do not support. Uh, I know that it increases the reach a lot of, uh, uh, yani, of messaging. Um, have you considered complementing these platforms with other interventions in order to be able to, uh, yani, to produce some uh, change uh, for those not who have actually contributed and uh, I mean voiced that or express their opinions, but the, the, those who are receiving actually this information. Yeah, so um, in general, the, 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 we are not an edutainment organization. So what we usually do is we do integrate the whole, the series in part of our programmatic work. Huh? So uh, this, this, this edutainment series also was part of a bigger program. Uh, so yes, we do have loads of uh, other types of interaction, working with uh, young people, um, part of the communities. We also uh, were uh, targeting this, this series uh, towards. Um, but I, yeah, how to say, so, so what could maybe have been the case is that the young people we were working with were also part of the series. I don't know. I don't know how how this uh, we were we were really puzzled by, by the outcome of the randomized control trial. I have to say it was not clear uh, what the exact reason was for the for the for the little change we saw. But yeah, just just to answer your your question, we all we make it we always make it part of another of a, a range of interventions, and um, it's it's not standing uh, on itself. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Paul uh, on uh, the Q and A, but Paul, the, your question is not very clear. Uh, we're going to give you the floor. Brahim, can we uh, unmute uh, Mr. Paul Atwin? Atwin? I'm not sure. So maybe he can uh, ask his question in person. Go ahead, Paul. Hello, how are you? Fine. Hello, you. how are you? Yes, go ahead, Paul. Yes, my name is uh, Paul Atwin. I am from Uganda. I'm the senior communications manager of Richer Hand uh, Uganda. It's a youth-led uh, organization that um, advocates for livelihood, wellness, and sexual reproductive health in youth. Now, we have uh, a, a show like yours, uh, but more towards uh, students at college that addresses uh, sexual and gender-based violence and also sexual reproductive health. However, my question was, uh, in, in the show that you're running, uh, in case you're using social media and you're using a hashtag to kind of carry the conversation along, uh, do you get trolls or people jumping on the hashtag to share negative sentiments about the message and direction of the show? And how do you mitigate that? Do you block some of these people? So your question is addressed to uh, uh, to Katinka, right? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Paul. I, I would have to ask our um, uh, the, the the people that at that time managed the, the online uh, engagements, but um, it is it is clear uh, that you will. Will, you will be you have to really dedicate yourself to it it's not something that you can do on the sidelines so you do need to be on top of things um, so that's what happened we had a, we had a team of people working on that huh? it's not something that we just posted and, le and then left to the uh, to the audience um, but I can't answer your uh, question whether actually content was blocked I would have to check that with uh, with the um, with that team that was working on that Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Katinka. Uh, I don't see any other, right, Jumana? Uh, I don't see any other questions uh, on the chat. Uh, maybe, uh, so I'm going to give the floor to each uh, presenter uh, for final uh, comments from their sides. Just a second, there is a question. 
there is a question from Dr. George Georgi. Um, any, okay, so what about working partnering with big producers of TV series that are aired by famous TV channels? Uh, in fact, as mentioned, TV series are passing wrong messages and role models to the entire society, including adolescents. So any plans for, uh, and I think this question falls under maybe uh, widening the scope to more marginalized, let's say, um, and disadvantaged populations that are not very digital uh, or young uh, people. So any chance of uh, airing these or working with TV channels? I think that's the, the main question. Turning it into TV series, I think this could be, so I think if you answer, and I think this would be relevant also for the others. Yeah, no, uh, thank you uh, for it. I think, um, well, when we, when we started out, we wanted to, to put it on television. Uh, when we started out the series, we wanted to first broadcast it on television, but then uh, all of the uh, scoping studies uh, indicated that we, we, better, we were better off uh, putting it online. Um, having said that, uh, yes, I, I, I agree that uh, in the main uh, region, but I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's a, very, a very common thing across the globe. Um, um, yeah, coming up with a positive answer to a, sometimes a very negative uh, portrayals on television is something that we, we could uh, do way more and, and also entering a discussion uh, with those producers on, on, on the responsibility of, of, of the sector uh, on roles that I think that would be a very interesting um, uh, uh, thing. Yeah, maybe others have something to, to add to this. Uh, maybe Gaia or Sarah Jean. Um, yeah, I think uh, our journalist. <laughs> Yeah, you're referring to me. Okay. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, that's a, it's an uh, um, it's a difficult type of work because it's it means building the culture of TV producers. So it's it's a really long term and heavy uh, type of work. But I fully agree that that's the key. I will say um, we are the, the little we are doing here in Egypt. We are trying actually to work as a, with the Supreme Council for Media Regulation, doing exactly that. Uh, building the culture, producing tools that me media producers can um, easily access uh, uh, to sensitize and to let them understand the role that they play and, and how simple sometimes can be to change those stereotypes. And if they do, then the impact that they can have uh, uh, at societal level is so huge, right? So, um, you know, that's I personally believe that that is the key and so yes producing more content but also uh, focusing on on partnership with those you know strategic uh, uh, counterparts such as the media absolutely so yeah <laughs> let's do it <laughs> okay great thank you uh, uh, thank you uh, Gaia um, I'm going to give the floor for each uh, speaker to for one minute, please, only uh, for final comments or additional reflections that they would like to make, starting with Sara. <clears throat> Thank you. And and Imam, yeah, and I think um, just to uh, echo, I think what Gaia said and, and the question, um, having come from the private sector, this is just not done enough and we need to be doing much, much more of this. Um, we need to be meeting um, the media where they are and understanding them better and creating win-win situations. We're actually um, gonna be speaking more about this at the um, Arab Forum for Sustainable Development on Thursday, if you're interested in terms of how to um, leverage the media uh, landscape in the Middle East region. Um, one just final thought, um, I, I think just to provoke us a little bit, and, and I think um, there were questions around this and what do you do if um, you create um, controversy or backlash um, from your programming? Um, and I think this really goes back to this idea of, if we want to change social norms, we have to get comfortable with the idea that what we're doing is essentially addressing things that are going to be uncomfortable. And we need to be okay with those conversations and actually creating discomfort 
it's part of the process of changing social norms. And I think this was really um, my question around working with governments and bureaucracies and even, um, dare I say, the UN um, who can be very risk averse and not want any um, sort of um, negative, anything that's seen as negative. And, you know, I think in our sector, um, it is an important conversation to have um, in terms of risk management. What do we mean by risk? Is a negative comment something that we should completely avoid? Or is it something that we should actually embrace and try to moderate and try to essentially create that into a public discourse? So I just wanted to leave us with that thought in terms of if we're serious about changing social norms, then we need to get comfortable with those uncomfortable uh, conversations. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think we tend to shy away from these uh, uncomfortable, let's say, discourses. Um, Gaia? Yeah, uh, perhaps, yes, I, I agree with what Sarah said. Uh, however, perhaps we can also add that uh, norms are changing anyway in, in, in the society, right? So perhaps our role could be, you know, simple as Let's look at where those norms are changing and let give visibility to those that are changing norms their way. So maybe again, a, a shift, a paradigm shift on what we do and how we um, operate uh, rather than saying what, but let's put ourselves in the position to make visible the change that it is happening in every culture, in every, the, the dynamics are there. So maybe our role is just to give light to those dynamics so that are perceived as the norm. And maybe the discomfort, uh, you know, you, 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 you embrace in a different way the discomfort somehow. Uh, and, and then perhaps my last point is um, an encouragement, encouragement to all of us to, uh, to, to cooperate and coordinate much better. We don't change behaviors with one intervention, with one campaign, with one product produced. So it, it's really how do we align the, the, the work that is happening, how uh, we synergize what it is happening out there. Uh, perhaps it's um, yeah, an appeal to all of us. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Over. Thank you, Gaia. Uh, Katinka, last reflections. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm echoing, uh, and I, I to to be to be honest, I really appreciate this webinar because I'm confronted with products I had never heard from about before. So I think it's it's also after the COVID period that we're now you know trying hopefully to to gather again and uh, to find out about learnings that are a little bit further away from the, the circle you operate in. So I appreciate this opportunity and I think it would be nice to um, maybe hope, hopefully on a regular basis uh, have these conversations um, where we can also exchange on, in our case, for example, um, you know, it, it wasn't all a success. I think the series was great. The Sari and Selma series was great, but we also had a lot of things that, that we needed to deal with. And it was a, a real adventure and also collaborating with young people, how to do that uh, and still have a, a high, high professional product. It was all a, a big adventure. So I, I appreciate learning and sharing uh, transparently about this with all. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, also Rania had a um, comment on the chat uh, uh, regarding designing effective programs to address social norms. And she says it's not possible without understanding how these norms fit within the larger set of factors that influence a person's decisions, uh, decision, of course. Um, I, I would like to thank all our, um, uh, all our uh, uh, speakers for giving the time, the attendees for uh, being here. Um, I think uh, what I would like to say at the end is that I'm really, uh, I, I really enjoyed these presentations and the fact that they are all grounded in uh, being, in coming from academia, uh, uh, being grounded in evidence and, uh, and, and theoretical frameworks that have actually probably would contribute to enhancing their relevance uh, and their effectiveness. Uh, of course, uh, we should be looking more into how we can evaluate all of these experiences, uh, as we said, uh, to see how we can bring about actual change 
uh, and behavior in, uh, in our communities. Uh, thank you very much to all. Um, we're going to close, uh, close now and hope to see you all again and definitely in the summit in December. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Dania, shall we? Is it here? Yeah, we well? need to do some okay. debriefing. <laughs> Bye. Bye.